What do we mean by the coast or the coastal zone? Let's talk about the different definitions and ways we can conceptualize our wider coast. <clears throat> Takeaways today at the end of this lecture will be um, our definition of what the coastal zone is. Um, we'll talk about that. Uh, what we mean by the shoreline and how important that is to be tied to our definition of tides and, and tidal height. The fact that we have no single def universal definition of what the coastal zone is. And then I want you guys to all take away some uh, key factoids and some key facts about um, populations. Key here is that there's a clear difference inland versus coastal in terms of our demographics. And then you should have a sense of what the legal definition for the coastal zone is in our state of California. So let's get into it. Now, what do, we mean by, what do we mean by the coast? We all have some basic conceptualization, basic understanding of what the coast is, but um, it actually is, can be surprisingly complex. In general, to get us going, most of our largest cities are located um, at or just about at the coast. The greatest density of people overall when we look planet-wide is at the coast. People are concentrated at the coast. We have in the United States, we have um, bound different bands of counties, which we usually use the term seaboards for. So seaboard is a sort of political construct, a sociological construct um, for the chunks of land adjacent to the different coastlines of our country. And these are usually centers of intense social, socioeconomic activity that have strong influences way beyond their immediate geographies. And then uh, important to realize that our coastal residents are distinct in terms of however we want to measure that, however we want to define that demographically, uh, patterns of movement, uh, economic uh, activities, etc. So our, we have a, a distinct coastal population that's separate from the rest of the um, land. Today, right now, more people are living in the coastal zone. We've yet to define that yet, but, but we'll, when we go to define it, more people are going to be living in that coastal zone than lived on the entirety of the whole of planet Earth in the immediate, uh, in the 1950s, in the immediate wake of World War II, which births the modern, uh, modern era of our planet that translates into something like um, uh, more than a billion humans in the immediate coastal zone, probably a bit more like uh, more than 2 billion if we use some of the wider definitions, but in the immediate touching, you know, almost touching the water types of folks, we're talking, you know, a billion. And if we get a little more generous, we're talking more like 2 billion or 2.5 billion people um, in the coastal zone. In the U.S., if we talk about, um, for example, our coastal shoreline counties, which we'll define in a second, um, uh, we don't have the most recent 2020 um, census data uh, out yet, but um, from the last decadal census, it was about 39% of all Americans lived in a, co in a county that touched seawater. And uh, that, that was about 123 million people. We think, we're thinking now when we get the data, it's going to be more like about 134 million right now. I grew up in California. I'm a product of California. And I grew up in Northern California. I was born and, and raised in, in San Francisco in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and there was always this tension, this tension between Northern California and Southern California. And you know, usually it was in times like this, like when we're having a drought and it was like, oh, those guys in Southern California, they use all the water and, and you know, we're saintly and we save all the water. And there's always these, these, this sort of a frenemy type of relationship between North versus South. And if you look through a lot of the um, cultural documentations, a lot of you know, hip hop or a lot of uh, novels or a lot of movies, that type of stuff, you'll really pick up um, on this North versus South dichotomy. And, and that really has entered into a lot of the conceptualization of many folks. So the lore is um, there is Northern California, which we could also break it up into Southern, Central, and Northern California. But, but for sake of argument, Southern California, which most folks define somewhere around Point Conception. So Point Conception in South versus 
everything else, the rest of Northern California. That is the historic, um, if not defined, then implicit understanding of how people break down in California. The reality is quite different. The reality is there's coastal California and inland California. So this nor nor Northern California, Southern California rivalry is just silly, right? It's really the folks that live at the coast versus the folks that live distanced from the coast. Most of our population lives at the coast. So uh, at least as the last decadal census, about 71% of we Californians live in a county that touches seawater. And we can go through uh, no end of demographic parameters to talk about this. And this, this, this coastal versus inland pattern is very robust and is very consistent. And we see this however we, just about however we want to slice the population. So here we have some polling data from the Public Policy Institute, but we see the same exact thing in our public polling. But we see, you see a general pattern. You don't even need to know what the questions are. In this case, it's, it's uh, belief in climate change, uh, what we should do to, uh, related to offshore oil drilling, uh, how big should government be. It doesn't matter what the questions are. Just look at the colors, right? The coloration. You see different um, relatively consistent patterns between stuff that touches the ocean and stuff that is farther inland or regions that touch the ocean versus regions that are farther inland. And we can see this pattern not just in California, but it extends around uh, the world, actually. But if we're talking about the U.S. here, in this case, this is how many years? This is a couple year old uh, data point. But, but the point is, uh, how many years do you have to work to afford a house in that region? And you see, again, don't need to even know what the data is. There, there's clear purpleness on the coasts. And in the middle of the country, there's clear greenness. So different, um, different demographies. If we talk about our most recent uh, pandemic goings on, same thing. So for example, on the right, you see areas where um, we have public laboratories that this was in the early days of the pandemic where we could get uh, robust, consistent testing. And by and large, those were located at the coast, very few inland. So the technological sophistication is greatest at the coast. If we talked about how we behaved on the left side here, this was, um, again, relatively early on in the pandemic. This is spring of early spring of 2020. And what we find is, uh, again, the coastal counties by and large were better at um, maintaining social distancing. And when we get into the interior part of the state, um, people were less effective at socially distancing from one another uh, when that was a clear strong recommendation from all levels of public health folks and uh, government. This is some recent data uh, and again this is just we could just go on and on but we'll, we'll stop after here but this is vaccination rate as of September 6, 2021 in the midst of the Delta surge and what we see here on the left is that um, the darker counties, more vaccinated or higher proportion of folks that are vaccinated. And uh, that's mostly the coast. And then again, if we look at risk levels, risk levels are highest overall uh, inland when we get to California in terms of uh, case rates as of September 6, 2021. So this, this coastal versus inland shows up however we slice the data. Um, now, historically, uh, again, uh, when the power base of California was in Northern California, originally um, before the U.S. was um, uh, uh, taken away from Mexico, before the, the Bear Flag Rebellion and all that, Monterey was the epicenter of political power. And uh, then soon after that, it moved to uh, San Francisco and then to an extent to San Francisco to Sacramento. And so initially, early on, there was a concentration in the early part of our state, I should say, there was a concentration in um, population, human population density in Northern California. But as we go, th as we went through time, pretty quickly, it started to, um, uh, the Southern California started to grow, and hence uh, some of the tension there um, and some of the supposed conceptualization of the North versus South rival rivalry is born. Um, but in reality, this is a much better breakdown. Uh, and so if we, if we look, uh, you know, say I only have it up till 2000, this data, but, you know, we're on the order of close to 50-50. It's about 60% south uh, versus 40% north. So close to 50-50. But as soon as we talk about inland versus coastal, it's quite 
obvious that there is a, a huge di uh, difference in terms of the number of residents in these regions. And this has remained pretty much constant for over a century. Okay, so that's that, 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 that's a little bit about demography. What about, what do we mean by the coastal zone itself? How do we define the coast? When we talk about the coast, everybody initially sort of runs to this idea and they're like, oh my gosh, yes, I, I totally know what we're talking about. I, I get that. Um, and uh, and I, I know what we're talking about. And then when we start to talk about the coast, it starts to be clear that some people have a more expansive definition than do others. And then it becomes clear that there's uh, these definitions can get a little messy. And so, uh, so here's the coast. And uh, this is out on Santa, you guys will all recognize this, or many of you will recognize this as a as, uh, view from Santa Rosa Island, where our research station is on the Channel Islands. Um, how we define that can be, now if, if we're at something like this, and it, maybe we, we might get lulled into thinking with a static image or, or one specific location, we might get lulled into thinking, oh, this is the coast, right? We can define the coast and we'll make up some, some definition or whatever. Increasingly, um, once you dig down, it becomes quite clear that the boundaries are hard to define, as with many things. Um, but in this case, on the left, we're looking at dust storms, um, blowing uh, terrestrial dust blowing off into the Arabian Sea. And so we're seeing that this terrestrial environment can strongly influence, in the example of dust deposition, the marine environment. It's not just the immediate intertidal zone or the immediate area, right, where we throw a rock and the rock would land in the water. Um, this is potentially quite large in terms of the influence of one of these regions of our planet influencing the other, the land versus influencing the sea. On the right is, um, is some artwork, just the same... Um, location seen through different lenses. And again, that idea that we, um, when we uh, think of the coast, we can, we can really um, imagine different factors, different layers. The coastal zone is three-dimensional, but generally in a practical sense, when we're talking about planning or some management policy, we oftentimes default to thinking of it as a two-dimensional thing, a two-dimensional skin recall it is three-dimensional we have air masses we have water masses um, these things are are uh, very uh, three to, uh, real world here we're not just looking at a flat map even though sometimes we default to looking at a flat map um, we can also talk about the shoreline so the shoreline would be the immediate uh, the, the the area that's immediately touching terrestrial and aquatic, the interface, direct interface between terrestrial and aquatic regions. Um, we sometimes, you sometimes hear the term coastline for that, but the better definition is shoreline. I'm going to define that for you in one quick second. For the purposes of our class, um, our key definition, conceptual definition, is um, the terrestrial area that directly influences the ocean. That could be in terms of uh, energy, that could be in terms of uh, materials, um, and then also the ocean area that directly influences the land. So the conceptual thing is uh, parts that influence the adjacent parts, right? So the terrestrial that influences the, the sea, the sea that directly influences the land. So that's going to be our key definition for this class. So make sure you, you have that in your head. Now, uh, conceptually, that's important, but when we start to get into actual numbers, hard decisions, we do need some clear, uh, uh, absolute definition to be able to draw lines when we do need to draw the lines. So our defin this this delineation should always be the default one you have in your head when when I say the coast or the coastal zone. Um, but but let's talk about uh, some other uh, more robust definitions. So first, I want to talk about what the shoreline is. So the shoreline. Sometimes you hear people call it the waterline, but, but the, the official term we want to use is the shoreline. Now, this is the area, the immediate, the exact area where the oceanic water touches the, the dry terrestrial land. Um, obviously, we have tides, so our ocean goes up and goes down, right? And so there's we have different types of tides. don't want to go too much into this. This is the purview of Dr. Patch's uh, oceanography class. If you've not taken that class, you should. It's a great class. Um, in our part of the world, we have what's known as mixed semi-diurnal tides. 
and that that's the majority of the world has mixed semi-diurnal tides which means we have a high we have two high on most days we have two high tides two low tides with one of those highs being higher than the other and one of those low tides each day being lower than the other and so um uh from that um we can uh begin to define some things so um the key definition here and, and so okay so so i should say so the tides are going to vary both uh, over a 24-hour period, over a, a day cycle, but also over a lunar cycle or a month-long cycle, they're also going to go up and down. So we have a couple different um, factors going on here. What we will use, though, to define the shoreline is mean higher high water, abbreviated as MHHW sometimes. Um, and that's the average height of the higher of the high tides measured during so-called spring tides, and that's just a, a term meaning um, the higher um, uh, phase of tides. So we're talking about the, the average of the higher peaks on the, uh, uh, for each day on the higher times of the elevated um, sea level. So that's mean higher high water. And so you measure that over a long period of time, right? And, and we used to measure it, literally measure it with, with rulers and things of that nature. In some places we still do, but, but primarily now we use more sophisticated methods. Um, but mean higher high water is going to be that so-called water line, right? That, 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 that supposed water line. And so the shoreline, therefore, becomes the line of contact between the ocean and the land um, at that particular uh, uh, elevation, at that particular mean higher high water elevation. Okay, so that's the shoreline. We say the shoreline, that's what we mean. How do you calculate that? How do I calculate that? I don't, right? We go and we download one of these um, uh, uh, data sets that has it delineated, but that's how we went about to calculate the specific data set. Okay, now this matters if you have a house on the shore or, or if you're trying to build a dock or whatever, because you, know, you really want, do want to know if this chunk of, of surface of the earth is is that, you know, on the shoreline? Is it landward of the shoreline? Is it seaward of the shoreline, et cetera? So that's our shoreline. So that's one way to define the, the actual, the literal interface, the literal shoreline of the coast. Um, we have other uh, definitions of the coast, and I think they're easiest to think of broken down into three different categories. Distance-based definitions, elevation-based definitions, and political boundary based definitions. So the distance based definitions and most of these things will play off of something like the mean higher high water level shoreline uh, uh, area or, 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 or um, elevation. Okay, so, so for distance based, we usually pick that line and then we go some distance, for example, inland. And this is really helpful using these types of definitions, these distance-based definitions, it's usually helpful when we're looking at pressures or threats to the coast. Things like housing supply, um, how much, uh, uh, you know, what fishing pressure there is if we're doing the, the seaward-based uh, distance. Uh, do we have a lot of vessels concentrated in this area? Do we have not that many vessels concentrated in this area? Elevation-based definitions are usually best used when we're trying to explore um, risks, hazards, vulnerabilities, so potential inundation from hurricanes, or if we're worried about long-term sea level rise and what that might do to properties and infrastructure. So elevation-based definitions of the coastal zone, really helpful in that sense. Political-based, uh, political boundary-based definitions are um, generally speaking, arbitrary, but they're very convenient. Um, and they're problematic for um, just about everything uh, except for uh, data collection because, because we generate a lot of our approaches to, um, to coastal management and a lot of these data sets we still use were really, uh, were really birthed in a pre-GIS world. And so it was a lot easier just instead of when it was back in the day hard to measure 10 kilometers from the mean higher high water line, it was easier to just say, okay, this county, let's just do all the economic output in this county, for example. So, so we can use, again, distance-based measures, elevation-based measures, or political measures to define the coastal zone. 
here are a few common uh, coastal zone measures that we um, use in various locations. So uh, low elevation coastal zone, this is area that's contiguous with the coastline and less than 10 meters in elevation. So low elevation coastal zone is a, is a common one. And this is, this is looking at the terrestrial side of the coastal zone. Another um, common one is some type of distance buffering. In this case, I, I, well, in this case, I would say, I think the most common is a hundred kilometer buffer, but um, we also see 50 and 200 kilometers uh, used um, uh, fairly commonly, but not as commonly as the hundred kilometer buffer. Uh, and so this is uh, easy to do when we're talking about something like Ventura County or something like Southern California, or even something like the West coast of the U.S. As we start to get to larger and larger scales, if we're asking how many humans are vulnerable or how many humans are in the 100 kilometer buffer coastal zone, it gets a little tricky because, um, uh, because of issues related to equidistance um, and projections. But nevertheless, that's a, very, uh, a pretty common um, a thing you will see in the literature. Then another common one is 10 kilometer buffer for the so-called immediate coastal zone. So that's the folks like, you know, the tightest tight folks. So, so infrastructure most on the coast, for example, or, or economic activity most strongly tied to the immediate coast. Um, 10 kilometer buffers are, are easy to use. Another one, um, would it could actually be population density. And this might seem not really totally intuitive, but this has to do with the fact that, um, uh, uh, we have the greatest concentration of humans, uh, generally speaking, at the greatest density of folks uh, at the coast. And this can be useful when we're, uh, one of the approaches when we're talking about um, quantifying pressures, quantifying impacts on the coastal zone. So population density is a useful um, measure. And another one is the proportion or the percentage of the coastal population living in urban areas. And so most of our, um, uh, uh, most of humanity since 2007, the majority of humans live in an urban setting. Um, first time, uh, more than for first time, the majority of humans uh, live so in the history of our species, um, and and we're just getting more and more um, in ur urban as we go forward through time. And so you can use this as a sort of rough proxy for the population density. Um, and uh, yeah, and I'll just say that. Okay, uh, so so those are some these are, these are some general measures for for co looking at coastal zone, uh, defining coastal zone, how we think about coastal zone, how we measure coastal zone. In the U.S., we tend to um, most commonly uh, use political uh, uh, constructs, political boundaries, and we can break those up uh, most commonly into what I consider three different bins. There's county-based measures. There's inland. Um, sea versus oceanic um, breakdowns, and that has to do with the Great Lakes. And then we have just some arbitrary definitions. So county-based, um, there's two main flavors of that. So we can talk about a coastal, uh, so we start with a coastal shoreline county. This is a county that touches seawater. So if you touch seawater, uh, there you go. Or for that, let me, sorry, let me step back. That would be um, a county that touches a large body of water by this first definition. So this also includes the Great Lakes. Watershed is a county that drains directly, the primary channel drains directly into the ocean. And so, I mean, ultimately all, or, or virtually all watersheds drain to the ocean, but here we're talking about specifically ones that, that are a direct feed into um, the the ocean. And so we can talk about coastal watershed counties or coastal shoreline counties. That's one uh, way to dif differentiate. The next would be um, a sea, quote, inland sea, quote unquote, versus ocean. So here we're talking about the Great Lakes. And so, so a lot of our policies are built on inclusion of the Great Lakes. That's because you get um, uh, more political buy-in for funding and policies, etc. Um, in most cases, we uh, here in California don't consider the Great Lakes um, oceanic. There, there's a lot of reasons why, you, in some cases, you might want to consider the so-called inland sea areas just the, similar to how we consider our oceanic uh, coastal areas. But in practice, uh, I, I think there's, there's some 
significant differences. Uh, we don't have sea level rise, for example, going on in these inland sea areas. So um, again, so when we're talking about coastal zones, you should be checking out or, or when you're pulling together statistics, am I talking about the oceanic stuff or the oceanic plus the Great Lakes? Next would be uh, basically arbitrary definitions. And that's what, when we get to talking about our California Coastal Act, we'll talk about that. And when we um, talk about sea level rise planning, um, we're seeing increasing uh, jurisdictions that are springing up that are using different coastal zone definitions uh, to deal with that management challenge. And so, you know, the, the def definitions do matter. And so here, for example, um, in, uh, uh, you can see, now this is including both the oceanic and the Great Lakes in terms of our definitions of um, coastal. And we're just looking at the lower 48 here. But you can see the blue represent coastal shoreline counties, and that's a you know significant area. But when we add in the green, those grow. So, so coastal watershed counties include both the blue and the green. And so, you know, it makes it you can see as you're starting to pull together data on population or data on uh, energy production or whatever it is, it really does we have to be clear which um, which types of um, for example coastline coasts uh, uh, counties, excuse me, are going into our definition of the coast. Okay, um, coastal counties. Um, our last big census. Again, we don't we don't quite have the 2010 data out yet, so I can't show you that data. But of 254 or 255, there's um, I can't remember why uh, that number flips, but but uh, 254 of our three of our more than 3,000 counties which is only 8%, roughly 16% of the area of the U.S., uh, touch salt water. So a relatively minor part. So, so the, the, you know, overall, we're talking about, um, you know, 10% or so when we talk about the coastal zone. It, um, um, it, it could be a little bit more or a little less, but um, we're talking about 8% of the number of our counties um, and 16% of the area of the U.S., but they can they contain um, in 2010 about a third of the population. Um, uh, and again, these numbers will change slightly when I'm talking about the percentage of people that are at the coast. Right, it depends if we're talking about a coastal county, a watershed county, if we're using a uh, distance-based definition of the coastal zone. So it is really important that you check when I ask or when someone asks. Um, you know, what definition of the coast are we using to calculate this? But, but for sake of argument here, in the 2010 census, you know, 16% of the area of the U.S. had 29% of the people living in one of those counties, including half of the most populous cities and 70% of the most populous counties um, uh, in 2010. Okay, the California coastal zone. Things get complicated. We have not yet discussed the California Coastal Commission, and we will, but um, I want to first just uh, uh, talk about them in the context of defining the coastal zone for most state laws and state policies here in California. So to avoid a huge long discussion, I'll just say that the California Coastal Commission really started much of our modern coastal zone management, um, particularly here in California. Um, it was the California Coast Commission was first established by voter initiative in 1972. I'll say that again. Ballot initiative be began the Coastal Commission. It started as Prop 20. So the people were asking the legislature to protect access to the coast, protect the health of our coast, deal with pollution, all these things, coastal development, regulate coastal development. And the legislature would not. So the voters on their own behest passed this proposition and created the Coastal Commission, then that freaked out the legislature. So they said, oh, actually, what we really meant is that we were going to do that ourselves. Yeah, that's a good idea. So then four years later, they codified that by the California Coastal Act, and that uh, uh, changed the Constitution and inserted the California Coastal Commission more directly into the uh, um, structures of government in California. And we've had that ever since 1976. Um, then the California Coastal Commission um, creates the California Coastal Management Program. That goes into effect in 1978. And so we've had this since 1978. Um, the California Coastal Commission is going to manage all the development in the, in the 
their definition of the coastal zone from 1978 onwards. The only exception is the, the um, ocean inside of the San Francisco Bay area that was already being managed by an organization called the San Francisco Bay Conservation and Development Commission. And so that, that predated the Coast Commission. So they, they do a lot of similar things, but, but, but the Coast Commission didn't, didn't um, uh, uh, kick them out essentially of their jurisdiction. And they'd only started a, a decade or so before. Um, uh, and so, so now we have the Coast Commission and this Coastal Management Program, and that uh, serves to um, purchase, protect, restore, enhance, and um, safeguard coastal access across the entirety of the length of California. So this, is, but only in the legal definition of the coastal zone. So they have a huge mandate, but it's only in this particular area. Now I'm showing you in gray and in pink the coastal. The, the legally defined California coastal zone. So the pink here is the terrestrial side of mean high or high water. The gray is the seaward side of mean high or high water that is controlled, regulated by the state of California. Okay, let's start with the gray because the gray is relatively easy. So the gray um, is the oceanward area that the state controls, we control three nautical miles, or the, or the state has control over three nautical miles out to sea. Um, and this was, and the desire to, to have access or to have a say in to control um, submerged land, so-called submerged lands initially, was this interest in oil. And so early 1900s, interest in oil is getting higher and higher and higher. People start building derricks out into the uh, uh, piers, out into the um, water, and, um, and start drilling. And then so there starts to be some contention. Hey, who's regulating this? Who's in charge? And so uh, California says we are, and they take it, and there's some fighting, and the feds want to control uh, oil uh, and gas production. And so in 1947, the Supreme Court says, no, California, you're wrong. The feds, the, the federal government owns and controls and dictates policy on all of the oceanic submerged lands. And so therefore they control all the oil and gas and they get to decide who drills, etc. That changes in Congress in 1953 with the Submerged, submerged Lands Act. And, and primarily that takes state that, that defines state control out to three nautical miles. Um, in most circumstances. There's a few weird places, um, some on the East Coast, where it doesn't quite work exactly that way. But for California, it's three nautical miles. So that's the gray. So it's very easy. Mean high or high water, you, you dr take your compass, you draw it out, or you get in your GIS and you, you um, do your buffer, and that's the seaward side. And again, three nautical miles is what we use. That translates to just a little bit less than three and a half statutory miles, or the kind of miles you measure in your, with your car's odometer. Okay. Now, the more interesting part, the more complicated part is the landward side of our coastal zone as defined here in California. So this was created, again, with the creation of the Coastal Act. And this was a pre-GIS political key here, a political construction. This was not a, hey, let's look at the, the, the ridge line. Let's not look at the watershed. It was, it was back and forth. And it was a pure um, horse trading political battle thing. So in some areas... The coast in some areas of California, the coastal, the legal definition of the coastal zone goes a tenth of a mile inland. In others, it goes uh, as far as possible, which is five nautical miles inland. No coastal zone area extends more than five miles inland from mean high or high water. So what that means is our terrestrial, so, so the extent seaward is pretty consistent, but the extent landward from mean high or high water is highly variable. In rural areas, it often goes inland to a big ridge line, um, or sometimes five miles, whichever is less, um, you, usually. Although, again, there's no hard and fast rule when they were creating this. Um, urban areas, it's usually quite narrow. It's really close, to, uh, virtually non-existent, and maybe only goes a block or two um, in places like Los Angeles. Um, and again, uh, the legal definition of the coastal zone, as far as the Coast Commission goes, it excludes the San Francisco Bay Area because um, they didn't, they don't control that. The Bay Conservation Development Commission controls that. And so, if we look at our own area, this is what it looks like. So, as we look here, we see that again, we have a consistent band. The three nautical miles is pretty, pretty consistent. As we go, not is not is 
is not pretty consistent. It is exactly consistent as we go around our islands or our mainland, etc. But when we get to our um, uh, terrestrial side, it gets really crazy. So again, when we're in some of these areas in, in you know, Venice Beach and things of that nature, it's, it's just a block or so. In other areas like the Santa Monica Mountains or the area around Point Conception, where there wasn't as much political heft back in the 70s when they were creating this policy, they said, ah, oh, we're going to go maximum. So you get this, this huge disparity in terms of uh, the extent of the coastal zone. And again, there is no rhyme or reason. This is a political construct. It's what it is. It's what we have. Um, and again, this is another representation here with the blue line being the terrestrial edge of the coastal zone. And you, you can see it a little more clearly here how it, how it goes over various um, um, uh, infrastructure and transportation nodes, etc. We do have, um, we do have uh, other examples of how we define the coastal zone. So I'll just give you a couple real quick here to wrap up. We have the coastal zone in Louisiana. And so, for example, that is defined under the Louisiana Coastal Management Program, which went into effect in 1980. It's regulated by their department, uh, what they call DNR, the Department of Natural Resources. And um, it's, it's, it varies, but it's much wider. So there it's, it extends anywhere from 16 to 32 miles inland from the coast. Um, and that's a huge area. And um, it's, it's more than 10 million acres. And that's um, a huge swath. Nearly half of all of our nation's coastal wetlands are found in that, in that swath. So, um, so that, that's a very inclusive definition of what we mean by the coast in Louisiana. If we look at North Carolina, North Carolina is probably the second most sophisticated um, uh, state in the U.S. after the U.S., uh, after California, excuse me, in terms of defining the coastal zone. And they uh, also started this in the 70s, a little bit after us, but, but in the 70s. Theirs is regulated by their Department of Environment and Natural Resources. And uh, they have 20 coastal counties that are either entirely or partially touching the ocean. And they have two flavors. They have sort of a, a tiered system of what they mean by the coast. So there's areas of environmental concern. And so those are what we might call the immediate coastal elements or, 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 or immediate coastal zone components. So things like wetlands, things like sand dunes um, and the like, sandy beaches, etc. And then they have this the second tier, which is areas that are potentially impacting those areas. So the areas that are potentially directly impacting the wetlands or the dunes um, also fall into their definition of coastal. Here's our coastal counties and uh, our, 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 our oceanic coastal counties um, in the U.S. and um, and they're, they're quite extensive. I'll also note that here as we're, as we're getting ready to wrap up that um, we do have, um, we do have uh, increasing challenges in the coastal zone, but one, one conspicuous thing is that we see increasing urbanization of, and, and, and concrete and structures and all of that stuff in our coastal zone. So this is an example from Australia. This is an example um, in, uh, in Hong Kong and in China. Um, so we, we both, we, we sometimes think of urbanization when we talk about the coastal zone or the hardening of the coastal zone as the stuff that happens on land that absolutely happens, but it can also happen out to sea. Either you can have artificial islands, uh, ports, harbors, structures of this nature that are artificial. And this activity, this hardening, this urbanization, um, this development of the coast has been going on for some time. So this picture is Huntington Beach in the 1960s um, with all these oil derricks. And we see that um, the number of people has been increasing. And so the, here I'm showing you data from 1960 to 2008. And we see a growing number of folks that are in the coastal zone, also that are in urbanized coastal zone settings. And that's a, a, a subtle but important thing to remember when we're talking about coastal zone, coastal zone populations, coastal zone management challenges. Um, we can look at that globally uh, with this... Uh, urban places tool. And so this is looking at areas that have, so each of the dots represent areas that have more than 5,000 inhabitants as defined by uh, nighttime illumination. We can overlay things like population uh, density from, um, uh, from the Grump, which is a global database. And we can then add on something like a 200 kilometer buffer uh, 
um, of the coast. And if we take everything else away and we just have that 200 mile buffer, what you see quite easily is that there's a lot of people at the coast and that particularly we have a, the, the greatest concentration in Southeast Asia. So um, Southeast Asia coastal populations are, um, are, are the epicenter in terms of um, humanity uh, proximate to the ocean. Um, but this, this density is, is increasing all over the place. It's not just an issue in Southeast Asia. All of our coastal zones are having more and more people uh, living there as we go through time. Here, in this case, we are looking at all of the U.S., right? So this is the number of people, the density of people going increasing through time. Um, and uh, we see that with however we want to slice it, coastal watershed or just coastal shoreline counties, et cetera. And then I'll just wrap with uh, one quick example showing the importance of maybe alternative definitions for the coast, right? So in this case, we're looking at um, potential problems due to sea level rise. And so this is a viewer from Climate Central looking at uh, our different counties and how many people in each of those counties are vulnerable to inundation or flood risk uh, under different scenarios of elevated sea level. And so uh, so here you're gonna see, here we have the, the the definition. So so the more the blue, the more people in that particular county. And so this is what it looks like at one foot elevation. Here's two foot. Here's three foot. Here's four foot. Here's five foot. Here's six foot. Here's seven foot. Here's eight foot. Here's nine foot. Here's ten foot. Right. So now it really matters. Uh, so so as we look in here and we see all this this reaching into the Sacramento Delta. Maybe that doesn't meet some of our definitions of coastal, but maybe in the context of elevation-based, um, it's really important to capture those folks. So maybe those folks should be in the conversation in terms of um, managing the coast and how we're going to engage with the coast. And then finally here, um, I'll just end with some of the wider approaches that um, the UN has taken to looking at coastal zone populations. They're the leader in terms of figuring out how we're going to um, uh, define the coast and therefore um, um, get our arms around the challenges of the coast and therefore go forward with management uh, answers and, and, and solutions. So they tend to like to use, the United Nations tends to like to use shoreline distances combined with elevation data. And that really is helpful when we're looking at both pressures and vulnerability. So pressures that we're exerting and then vulnerability to natural hazards in particular. Uh, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment uh, used uh, 100 kilometers or less from the shoreline and a 50 meter elevation. And they use an either or. So, so it, was, it was a more expansive definition. Um, a widely quoted paper uh, from oh, oh, well over a decade now, 2007, um, used uh, 10 foot or excuse me 10 meter elevations that are also contiguous with the shoreline um, and they didn't have a, a interior landward distance threshold but in most places uh, that was less than 100 kilometers and so so again this idea of elevation plus distance is really really helpful when we're talking about um, uh, vulnerability in pressure so that's our definition of the coast. So those are some of our conceptualizations of the coast. So to summarize what we talked about, our coastal, our coastal zone has a population such that we have most of our largest cities at or very next or just adjacent to the immediate coastal zone. The density of humans across the planet is greatest on average at the coast. We have these bands of counties uh, in the U.S., for example, the Atlantic, Pacific, and Gulf coasts. Uh, or, or, or seaboards that are really the concentration of socioeconomic activity in the United States. And we have very distinct demographic, migration, economic, et cetera, conditions um, at uh, the coast and our coastal populations exhibit relative to inland areas. For the purposes of our class, recall that our conceptual definition of what the coast is, is the volume of the sea directly influenced by the land and the volume of the land directly influenced by the sea. And that also includes the air there. I didn't say the air, but that includes, you know, the, the, the atmosphere as well. The idea of shoreline we talked about is tied to the idea of tides, especially the mean high or high water uh, line. We don't have a single universal definition of the coastal zone, but most of our definitions can be broken down into distance-based measures, elevation-based measures, or political boundary-based uh, measures. Oh, look, I typed that twice. It was so important. Um, and then uh, also in reviewing this, you should make sure you have some idea of coastal versus inland demographics. 
Right now, there are more humans um, alive in the coastal zone, however you want to define this, than were alive in just about all of the 1950s. So, so take all of humanity in the 1950s and squeeze them into the immediate coastal zone. That's Those are the pressures that our coast is facing. Depends on how we define the coast, which definition we're using, but it's somewhere on the order of 35 to 40 percent of humanity planet-wide lives at the coast, and that's roughly about only 10 percent of the land mass. Again, it's going to depend on our specific definition, but but that that's a good rule of thumb. 30 to 40 percent of people living on 10 percent of the land mass. In terms of the immediate coastal zone, um, about a billion people live in the immediate coastal zone, particularly concentrated in Asia. If we use some of these wider definitions, we, it's more about two, two and a half billion humans in the wider coastal zone, but but one billion in the immediate uh, on the immediate edge of our continents, for example. And in 2020, again, we don't have the final numbers, but it looks like something on the order of about 134 million people in the United States of America live in coastal shoreline counties, and that's about 40 percent of the total population. And then finally, California, um, we have our own legally defined uh, coastal zone that is uh, the main um, definition used by the California Coastal Commission and uh, development and management issues here in California. Thanks, you guys. Have a great day and hope you enjoyed this discussion of what we mean by the coast.